Brooklyn might buy him. Wait a minute. Technical difficulties. Oh, no, that's so funny. We had, we were just dropped. Okay, let me. You think it's still going? Yes, so oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're all set now. Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for attending. Welcome to our home. Uh, again, we're coming back after, well, I guess about three weeks off. And um, the topic this week, again, we're going to be dealing with, dealing with disappointment. Uh, this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine how one should deal with disappointments. Now, this Passover... My wife and I were looking forward to spending the holiday in Atlantic City, New Jersey, on a, a Passover getaway. You know, we had paid $10,000 for a 10-day vacation with accommodations at a five-star hotel located on the Jersey Shore on the Atlantic City boardwalk. Uh, for many years, my wife and I have hosted our extended family for the holidays. We are blessed in that we have two houses. One house we reside in during the weekdays. That house is a 45-minute walk from our synagogue. Our second house is only a 10-minute walk from our synagogue and is the residence that we occupy only on Shabbos and Jewish holidays. We enjoy the fact that Shabbos and the Yom Tovim, the holidays, are not, are, are not only special days, but in our case, they are actually a special house. So I was happy to be able to spoil my Ashes Chayel, my lovely wife of 52 years, with the luxury of not having to clean two houses for the holiday. Well, she was more than grateful and was looking forward to our vacation. All of the clothing that she intended to bring on the trip, she had already laid out in a guest room ready to be packed. My wife is originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, she has one sister who still lives in Philadelphia. Her sister had planned to drive into Atlantic City for the day so that the two of them could spend some quality time together. Now, due to the COVID pandemic, they had not seen each other for the last four years. In addition, we had made plans to spend the Shabbos immediately after the holiday, which ended on Thursday night, with dear friends at their home in Westchester, New York. Well, everything about the trip seemed perfect. My wife doesn't like to fly, so driving from Michigan to Atlantic City was doable. The truth was that we could have gone anywhere, <laughs> as long as my wife wasn't compelled to clean both of our houses. As they say in Yiddish, a machaya, a pleasure. She now would not have to stand in long lines with other holiday shoppers, um, buying all the food that we would need for the holiday. Uh, there was nothing to, for her to cook or prepare for the Sudaran, and she was under very little pressure. And the truth is, she was very happy. As the saying goes, happy wife, happy life. Now, most years during this hectic time of the year, like most husbands, I try to stay out of my wife's way. There isn't much that I can do right. You know, I've learned that during this period of time, I began all my sentences with two words. I'm sorry. We had placed our reservations in January, and we, had paid, we were paid in full for the vacation. Our friends and family wished us well, and we were looking forward to a wonderful and exciting holiday. Everything, everything that we wanted would be available for our enjoyment. Great food, accommodations, entertainment, indoor pools, exercise room, Torah classes, the ocean, ca casinos, shows. Uh, we were both excited and looking forward to our Passover getaway. Five days before the holiday was begin, we received an email from the program organizer. It stated that he had been scammed by some group in Nigeria and that he was hoping to arrange something, but as of the moment, the trip seemed dubious. The email made no mention of any other options or refunds for the money that we had prepaid. The organizer then did not accept any credit cards as payment. We could only pay by cash or check. The next day, we were informed that the program had been canceled. So with only four days left before the holiday, both my wife and I had no choice but to rush and clean both of our homes 
before the holiday began. Shopping, as you can imagine, was a nightmare, but we managed to buy all the food that we would need for the eight days of the holiday. Now, we are blessed in that we live in a very warm and loving community. We are surrounded by both family and friends. So we were invited out for both of the Siddharam, <clears throat> in addition to all the meals during the holiday. So getting back to the theme of this, my thought, how does one deal with disappointment? I live with the firm belief that Gamzu Latova, that this too is for the best. A statement mentioned in the Talmud in the name of Nachum, Nachum Ish Gamzu. There are many things that we believe in that are based only on theory. But when it comes down to reality, it's not so simple to express our thoughts into action. The Talmud tells us that we are to bless and thank God for the bad, just as we bless and thank God for the good. This thought can be best understood through a story. You know, they tell the story about a great rabbi who operated a yeshiva in Russia. He would lease land yearly from the government and then harvest the trees on the property to be sold as lumber at market. He would then use those profits to support the school for the year. Well, one year he decided that rather than go through the same process year after year, that he would borrow all the money that he could. And with all that money, he would lease enough acreage so that he would be able to support the school permanently. So that is what he did. He leased the land from the government. He then harvested the trees and had them loaded onto three ships that would transport all the lumber to market. The three ships set sail. But as they entered the Black Sea, all of the three ships capsized in a raging storm, and they sank to the bottom of the sea. Well, the rabbi had not yet heard of the tragedy. However, the news had reached some of the rabbis and a few of the elite students in the school. No one, no one wanted to be the one to inform the tzaddik that his three ships had capsized and that he had lost everything. Not only would his dream of supporting the school forever not materialize, but now hmm, he was deeply in debt. Finally, one of his brighter students volunteered to break the bad news to the Rebbe. The student went to the Rebbe's office. He told the Rebbe that there was a statement in the Talmud that he found difficult to understand, and he was hoping that the Rebbe would be able to clarify the meaning for him. He quoted the above-mentioned Talmudic statement that a person is required to bless God on the bad, just like one is required to bless God on the good. The Rebbe nodded his head. He knew the statement of the Talmud well. He explained to the students that even when someone experiences difficult times, still, they should dance for joy, since nothing, nothing that God does is bad. There are, of course, things that can be bitter, but in the end, we can be certain that things will be better. The student continued, well, let's just say that you were to find out that the three ships that you sent to market had capsized in the Black Sea. What would your reaction be? The Rebbe answered, I would be compelled to dance. The student responded, then the Rebbe should start dancing. When the Rebbe realized what his student had intimated, he passed out cold. Well, they revived him only to have him pass out again once he realized the gravity of the situation. Finally, the third time, he composed himself. But then he turned to his student and he said, Now I too do not understand the statement. There are things in life that we theorize about only to find out that the reality of things is many times quite different. However, the opposite can also be true. That just maybe... Just maybe if we tell ourselves a truth over and over again, then just maybe it might become part of our spiritual and intellectual DNA. As the saying goes, if you can talk the talk, then you should be able to walk the walk. I was very impressed with my wife's attitude when she realized that we would not be going away for the holiday. That was in addition to the fact that in all probability our money would not be refunded. My wife, by her nature, is a thrifty woman. She does not waste anything. You know, I often jokingly tell her that some poor guy on welfare lost his opportunity when I married her. I was certain, I was certain she would be really upset. 
people questioned her about our receiving a refund, and her response was you know, that she highly doubted that we would be receiving any of our money back. Her reaction was quotable. She told them, we didn't lose the money. We just didn't use the money. In hindsight, there was another be hidden benefit that we experienced. Like most religious women, my wife begins her nightmares about the preparations and cleaning for Pesach immediately after Purim. The silver lining in all of this was she only had four days to agonize over it. So the bottom line is it turned out to be a blessing in disguise for both of us. Well, at least her. I had to clean. <laughs> I live with the firm belief that every Rosh Hashanah we are judged. It is the time of the year when God decides as to how much money we are going to earn during the upcoming year. How and when we are able to receive our income is in God's hands. We, of course, have to do our part by investing the proper amount of time and effort. But in the end, we have to know that success is God's domain. All that we supply is the effort. So if for some reason we have been deprived of certain funds that God has allocated for us on the new year, it then becomes his obligation to replace those funds. On the other hand, if that money had not been designated for our pocket, well, then those funds were just something that went through our hands, much like a businessman. It was never meant to be ours in the first place. You know, I believe that everything that happens in our lives is in some way orchestrated by our loving Father in Heaven. Nothing, nothing is an accident. In life, there are many things that can go wrong, especially when a person is on the road. We have a saying in Hebrew that the Sutton, the devil, Yosheb Badera, waits on the road. It's funny, but many times we work harder on a vacation than we do when we are at home. Many people say that they need a vacation after their vacation. Many of our friends extended their sympathies and regrets, which of course we appreciated. They expressed their amazement that we didn't seem to appear to be overly upset, if at all. You know, our lives together and our relationship is based on a strong belief in God Almighty and all that he chooses for us. In a way, I felt sorrier for the organizer of the affair than I did for myself. He has lost everything. He's out of business and he has lost his good name. I can't begin to imagine living with that weight on my conscience, both to man and to God. We enjoyed two amazing Siddharam with my nephews and nieces. We tried something new this year that I had read was the practice of a certain Godel, a certain great man. He would conduct his Siddharam properly, but quickly, no commentary. Then he and his guests would eat their dinner. It was only after dinner, while his guests sat around with their dessert, that they talked for hours about the story of the Seder and all of its deep mystical meanings. So we did the same thing. And the Siddharm were great. On the first night, we were so engrossed in our conversations on the Haggadah that I had to be alerted to the fact that we only had 10 minutes left to eat our afikoman. It reminded me of the five rabbis in the story of the Haggadah who had spent the whole night discussing the exodus from Egypt. It was only in the morning that they were reminded by their students about the time that they had to stop. Through the years, I have been given the title in our congregation of the Shul Storyteller. Since I was home for the holiday, I was honored to be able to tell over two inspirational stories in connection, in connection with the theme of the holiday. This, of course, was something that would not have occurred if I had been in Atlantic City. So I would like to conclude this, my thought, with the story that I ended our gathering at our shul at what we call the Suda Tamashiach, the meal of the coming of the Messiah, a Hasidic custom where many members of the congregation gather together at a meal at the end of the last day of the Passover holiday. At this meal, it is customary to eat matzah, drink four cups of wine, and to share in inspirational words and stories. The story I told was a true story about a Dr. Chanel Chaim Howie Leibowitz. He is a graduate of Harvard Medical School, where he later taught. He divided his time between practicing in Boston, Massachusetts, 
and Yerushalayim. Today, he is an internist in Lakewood, New Jersey. He began his religious studies in the Yeshiva Beis Torah in Yerushalayim. There, he became enamored by the brilliance and guidance of the Rosh Yeshiva of Noah Weinberg. He became a teacher in Eish Torah's Discovery Program. At the time of this story, he was a senior resident in Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. He was in charge of the emergency room. And so one day, he heard on the loudspeaker, Code Blue, which was an alert of a life-threatening emergency. He made his way to the cafeteria where a woman had suffered a, a massive heart attack. Security had emptied the cafeteria and the doctors were working feverishly, trying to, to bring her back to life. He approached one of the doctors who was kneeling next to the patient. He asked him, how's she doing? The doctor shook his head and said, I'm afraid that it's too late. I think she's gone. Dr. Leva said, well, let me try. He inserted an intravenous catheter directly into her heart, which would prevent any progression of a blood clot to her coronary arteries. Using a defibrillator, he applied an electric shock to jumpstart her heart. He tried once, twice, three times, but he was unsuccessful. He tried once again, and one of the doctors present said, hey, no, it's useless, she's gone, but he wouldn't give up. He tried a fifth time, and then miraculously on the sixth try, a bleep appeared on the heart monitor. He had a heartbeat. He ordered the medics to transfer her immediately to the ICU for treatment and observation. Well, Dr. Libos returned to the emergency room, but from time to time he would check on the woman's progress, even though she wasn't his patient. Now, then he debated with himself as to whether to visit her or not, and the more he thought about it, the more he was certain that that's what he should do. He found out that her last name was Kelly. So he thought to himself that if I, with a Jewish name like Leibowitz, visit her, it would be what we call a Kiddush Hashem, a sanctification of God's name, since she would realize that it was a Jew that had saved her life. So when he entered her hospital room, there was a man sitting on her bed. When he saw Dr. Leibowitz, he quickly turned to his wife and said, He is the one. He is the one I told you about who saved your life. Dr. Leibowitz asked the man who he was and how he knew him. The husband replied that he was watching outside the cafeteria through a glass wall. The woman began crying, and she listened as they talked. She was finally able to compose herself, and she then said to Dr. Leibowitz words that he would never forget. She said to him, what do I say? Thank you? Hmm, thank you. Thank you is what you say to someone who has opened a door for you not to someone who has given you back your life. I will tell you this, that when I go home and I see my children, I'll remember you and I'll say, thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. And a week from now, when I take a walk with my husband, I will think of you and I'll say, thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. The next time I go out with my friends, I will think of you and I will say, thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. And the next time I have a birthday, I will think of you and say, thank you, Dr. Leibowitz. You know, her words were heartfelt and moving. When Dr. Leibowitz left her hospital room, he thought to himself, when I come home tonight and I see my wife and my children, I'm going to say, thank you, Hashem. And the next time that I pray and I feel connected to God Almighty, I will say, thank you, Rav Noah Weinberg. And the next time that I learn Chumash, I will say, thank you, Rav Noah Weinberg. And the next time I walk up a flight of stairs and I don't get out of breath, I will say, thank you, Hashem. I think that all of us can say the same words to God, our Father in heaven, for all the good that he bestows upon us, each, each of us, each and every moment of each and every day. We always need to remember the Gam Zula Tova, that everything, everything that happens to us in our lives, somehow, some way, is always for the best. That being the case, my wife and I, thank God Almighty that we were exactly where he wanted us to be, sharing a wonderful holiday with family and friends. And with that thought in mind, let us help to usher in the coming of Mashiach to Canaan quickly in our time. Now, normally, after I give this class on my thought, 
I move on to a Chumash class in Bar. Thank God I finished that series, 503 lectures, uh, the gematria of the words Mazan uh, and the Shama, food for the soul, and I hope you'll be able to avail yourself of that series. Again, it's on Spotify and on YouTube, as well as my website, again, which is listed here, and base Mordechai. Mord um, if there's any class that you would like to hear, again, we're still knocking around what to do. We have certain ideas. But for right now, I'm going to give my thoughts. Hopefully, I'll continue to be inspired by God with topics that are interesting, informative, and current. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, if you have any idea about what you would like to learn, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Um, again, thank you for attending, for listening, and uh, hopefully we'll share many more events together. God bless and be well. Shabbat Shalom. Stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe. Again, God should bless you only with good. Again, thanks for attending.